sponsored public meeting for the Lovejoy War Notice of Project Change. Um, I will let Peter go through the details, but um, as I'm assuming most of you are aware, the, uh, the site is an active construction site with Congress going in at the 161 North Washington Street portion of the site. And this, the subject of this evening's meeting is to discuss the changes that are proposed for the 131 Beverly Street portion of the site. The comment period um, ends on November 6th. Next Wednesday, November 6th. Comments should be sent to uh, the attention of Casey Hines. Um, if you don't already have an agenda, her information is here at the bottom of this. And also, um, make sure you sign in uh, to the um, sign-in sheet on the table to your left uh, before you leave if you haven't already. And I'll turn it over to all right, so this is, um, this is a little bit of a test because this side of the room has already heard everything and some of the people here as well. So oh, wait, to... one more thing. This is being recorded, so I just want to let everyone know that. And if you don't know what your voice sounds like on YouTube, <laughs> ask a question tonight and you will soon find out it's not pretty. Um, <laughs> it's like someone has a closed in on my nose. Um, so I'm Peter Spellios with Related Deal. Uh, Kim Sherman, my colleague, is also here. Uh, and Kim and I are, are working on the 131 uh, Beverly Street uh, building, and that's what we're here tonight to talk to you about, which is the subject of our NPC um, filed with the BRA. Um, and again, I'm going to do it as quickly as I can because I understand that at 807, the building shuts down and the lights turn off. Um, so, uh, 2012, December of 2012, many of you may remember. Filed an MPC at the time that we were about to acquire Lovejoy Wharf uh, from its longtime owners, Ajax. Uh, and that MPC uh, related to what is the 160 North Washington Street building. And the primary uh, request at that point was to change the upper floor used to floor two and up from a residential use as apartments to a commercial use office. At that time, it was an unnamed tenant that was interested. Um, Everybody in the world knew that name of that tenant was Converse. It was just not publicly announced at that point. Uh, and subsequently, Converse has signed a long-term lease to occupy um, floors two and up uh, of this building here. That was the main change in which we discussed uh, that we discussed in December 2012. Um, we um, <coughs> were pretty clear back in December that, in light of the fact that we had just acquired the property, in light of the fact that the discussions with the then unnamed tenant very quickly. Um, we had not spent any time contemplating what would happen to the rest of the project, specifically the 131 Beverly Street building. Originally in 2006 when approved, this was going to be one big residential project, connected residential project. It was going to be um, all apartments. Um, when we made the decision in 2012, December 2012, and the BRA board voted in favor to convert this to a commercial use on the upper floors, uh, in essence what we were doing was Dividing off this building from this building and making a freestanding, totally separate uh, buildings from each other. Um, as I said in December of 2012, we were going to use the next several months to re engage the design team and look at what was left over of the residential project and work on reformatting it in a way which we thought would work and would complement the Lovejoy War area. The one clear rule that we gave to our team that I expressed back in December of 2012 was that we were going to respect the existing permitted height limitations on this project. Um, and that indeed is what our design team did, and I'm standing in front of them. Uh, we engaged Robert A. M. Stern Architects, who was the design architect that did the Clarendon for our team that we completed uh, on Stewart and Clarendon Street, we completed that in 2009. We brought on Ad Inc. as well uh, to assist with the design of Lovejoy Wharf um, and asked them to uh, very quickly, uh, over the last several months, re envision you know, what the 131 building can be. And what it came to be was a building that looks, in terms of um, elevations, very similar in terms of heights because they are the same heights. Uh, in terms of aesthetics, different because there is more masonry in areas where there was less masonry, more glass in areas where there was more. Um, and really just an aesthetic difference in terms of what we wanted the product to look like compared to what the originally uh, approved 2006 project um, was. And so again, this is as of December 2012. This is uh, the current NPC, this building remaining exactly the same, which is the Commerce building. And this being the uh, newly proposed 131 Beverly Street building. 
Portal Park being the city of Boston Park right here. And if you look across that passageway, you can see the bunker has been aligned, so you can see the bunker alignment uh, through that passageway. Again, all designed to really draw people's eyes to be that sense of presence and, and welcomeness to the wharf um, out of there. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about, and then I'll, or two things I'll talk about, and then I'll welcome questions here has to do with, we made the decision to change from apartments to condominiums. That decision um, is a decision that uh, we made for, for several reasons. Um, number one, um, there was a recognition um, of where this building sat in relation to its neighbors, um, specifically the Strata building, which was located right across the alley um, from us. And I think for years, this building has treated, um, in a lot of respects, has treated the Strata building as out its back door instead of out its front door. And the reality is the Strata is in the front yard uh, of this building, and that being a condominium ownership building, um, I think there's a recognition that in this neighborhood it made sense, it was complementary to have a less transient population to the extent possible, um, and to be consistent with that. Secondly, admittedly there's recognition that virtually every project that this neighborhood has talked about for the last five years has been apartments. Uh, and we recognize that, we recognize that there is many apartments that are going through the permitting process, there are many apartments that have been built and just opened, there are many apartments that have done with the permitting process and will be, and uh, currently are all anticipated, mostly all I should say, anticipated to be apartments. And so we thought this was uh, a logical conclusion for us. Um, we also had um, really fantastic success with apartments uh, at the Clarendon project, which we finished in 2009 in the Back Bay, um, and really feel quite bullish uh, about the condominium market. The last thing, uh, which also relates to the condominium decision, has to do with what we do with parking. That's probably what's gotten the most discussion to date on this, which had to do with the original approved 2006 drawings had a 315 car robotic garage, uh, which was exactly what it sounds like. A machine would lift your car once you put it into a certain area in an elevator and put it into a rack system, uh, in, which was located in the belly of the building. Uh, back to the 2006 plans, the belly of the building right here had a big space that went up almost 11, I think it went up 11, and 10 floors, and with no interstitial uh, floors in it, just a big open space with racks, that somehow, some way, some machine was going to park 350 cars in there. Um, we expressed skepticism back in December about both the size and it being robotic, um, and we've all only come out to the conclusion um, to eliminate the garage altogether here. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions about that, so let me just say a couple of things about that decision. Um, number one, it's uh, when we spent more time with the project, admittedly in December of 2012, um, we were novices as to this location, as to where this sits in relation to its neighbors, where it sits in relation to the community. Um, but we suspected that when the neighbors started talking about conflict in the alley, conflict in Lovejoy Place, conflict in in Beverly Street, both vehicular and pedestrian, that they were that they knew something, that they weren't wrong about what it is. Um, and what really struck us was um, a realization that this area here in particular, and I'll talk about Beverly Street in a second, because there's been some significant changes there. Uh, in the alley in particular, there's really only 50 feet. The original approved project was 50 feet from the end of what I'm gonna call the Strata Building, which is the building right here. 50 feet over to where the new proposed building is going to be. Um, and in that 50 foot width would exist a loading dock for that serves the commercial portions, I believe, of the Strata building that's already been there, which is down here. Um, loading docks for the 160 North Washington Street building. Um, a garage entrance and exit for the residential portion of the garage for the Strata residents underneath their building. Uh, commercial parking spaces for the commercial uses, uses in the commercial floors below the Strata residences. And if this was to have been built, a parking garage for 315 cars. Um, candidly, we never came to a conclusion um, as to how all of that really exists well together in that limited of a space, so that was a consideration for us um, in terms of our decision here. Um, secondly, we've had, um, I've already talked about some of the physical constraints on the site where we had to reuse a lot of the first floor of this building for resiliency and other purposes that wasn't originally anticipated back in 2006, which um, I think created some logistical challenges for us. Um, third, we've had really um, strong success at the Clarendon and other projects in terms of 
um, really been surprised by how few condominium owners, even being high-end condos in certain situations, how few of them really are car dependent and really have cars or park cars in the garages that we built historically. And then last, we recognized that, that we were in a non-parallel neighborhood, where the proximity both on foot and in public transportation to get anywhere in Boston is really remarkable from this neighborhood. I will be the first to tell you this is not an idea that can happen just any neighborhood in Boston. I, as a matter of fact, I think there are very, very few neighborhoods in Boston that this idea can, can happen here. So we took that all into consideration. Um, the last part, which relates to parking, but also relates to the vehicular and, and pedestrian environment here, really had to do with Beverly Street. Uh, in our view, and this was feedback, it's, it's not a novel idea, it was feedback that we got in 2012 when we were going through uh, the commerce process and we were talking to neighbors. Um, Beverly Street seemed to always be left unfinished meaning the plans never really showed any of us what Beverly Street, any of you, I frankly didn't even notice about the project in 2006, what Beverly Street can become. And the reality is that Beverly Street, by virtue of the new wharf that's happening in this project, and, and this plan here is a bunch of lines just to show you pedestrian paths, both from the Harbor Walk, um, from the locks down, Beverly Street cutting across through the passageway. By virtue of this project happening, we are changing forever pedestrian behavior in this neighborhood. We are really creating a new opportunity, a new neighborhood for people to be walking through um, when they're coming over the North Washington Street Bridge, by the virtue of the Grand Staircase, or coming from the Harbor Walk, which goes underneath the North Washington Street Bridge through here, or coming down from the locks and drawing you onto the wharf. That really, more than ever, this is a multi-modal environment. This is no, Beverly Street is no longer a paved 24-foot wide road leading to the state of the We needed to treat Beverly Street different. Why? because it really is in the street that wants traffic to go down to the west. I'll tell you, the state police don't want cars going down to where they are. As a matter of fact, they, they have expressed very strongly and unequivocally, not surprisingly, that that's what they don't want. They want cars to stay out of beyond the wharf here. Um, but also, it's an environment that when you pull into Beverly Street, uh, we want to create an environment that says you've arrived somewhere, not that you're going somewhere, right? So that cars, over time, will learn. Turning onto Beverly Street isn't an you know, a place that you just turn because it's another street and you're, you're searching for something. You know you're coming here for a purpose and a purpose only. And over time, it's our experience in other environments that if you treat the environment correctly, the landscaping correctly, and you send the right messages, uh, it really teaches people about what their behaviors will be and that they'll decide, this is not a convenient place for me to be. This is not a place that's going to lead me anywhere. I'm not going to go down this area here. So we really have gone to great lengths to, from the wharf down to the causeway, to say we've got to get rid of the asphalt. We've got to work with Mass Staff, who owns Beverly Street, and find a way to soften that to figure out what pavers they will okay. Mass Staff has certain specifications for what paving materials and pavers and what you can use. So we're working with them to say this needs to be landscaping. It needs to feel differently than another roadway here um, in Boston. Uh, not to mention all the greenery. The other thing that's significant is, and a point of conversation that's come up quite often related to the parking lot in front of, again, what I'm going to call the Strata Building, but as you know, when you pull onto Beverly Street, right on the right-hand side is a big, open, what I'll call a parking lot that um, is um, somewhat unlandscaped and, and a tremendous amount of asphalt. Am I doing it justice by describing it as an asphalt garden? Yes. I call it that, mm -hmm. that area? I mean, it's, it's, First it's, a, it's a lot of asphalt, right? Um, I will tell you there's been a lot of questions, both from the city, from BTD, from the neighbors, about saying, you know, is that always going to be that way? I will tell you that Spear Street, who owns the commercial side of the building, has expressed an interest in doing something different to greening it up, creating a hard edge. They obviously have to work with the residential component of, of the building as well. But assuming that happens, there's an opportunity there to really kind of create a, a harder edge on the east side of Beverly Street as well. So again, you're not pulling into an area that's just a parking lot. You're pulling into an area that's a destination that's more plaza-like. It feels as though if you're here, you're here for a reason. And if you're not here for a reason, you're in the wrong place and you're not going to come again. Um, it's kind of from, from a vehicular standpoint, the message we want to send. From a pedestrian standpoint, we want to create an environment that makes people feel actually pretty good about standing almost anywhere when they get over here. Now, we don't want them standing in the middle of the street, but, but we certainly want them to feel as though this is an environment where they want to be drawn to, where they don't feel as though it's wrought with vehicular conflict. So, We've been working really hard with Coffee Wolf, with the VRA design team, um, and um, you know, hopefully, you know, something can be done down here. It's not on property that we own, but you know, to really create that environment, to really soften uh, 
this edge tremendously. As importantly, and you'll notice here, this softening stops when it gets to a certain point down the down Lovejoy Place or the alley. We also we can't put up a gate on Lovejoy Alley. There's too many vehicles from Strada coming in and out and other uses happening here. But certainly we want to do something that tells people that this isn't a place where you should be driving your car. By virtue of taking that garage out of there, we no longer have all, you know, 315 cars, or even if it's half that amount, going into the alley to park in the garage. We want to do something. We want to treat, whether it's, it's landscape treatments, whether it's asphalt treatments, or, or paper treatment, whatever it is, we're working on finding a way to be able to say, if you're going past this point, you know. You may still do it, because we can't, you know, we're not going to put spikes in the road to pop your tires, but you know you just went somewhere that, for some reason, something's telling you this is not really where you're supposed to be going here. Again, we don't want the, the, the traffic in the alley here. I will tell you through through the construction of the 160 project, which is ongoing here. Um, again, this building here, um, we've got to know um, uh, Bill Smith and Colliers, who's the property management team for. Is, is it there? There yeah. he is, right there. Uh, and, and I'll tell you that they and I, and I hear it through through our team, our construction team. It's it's a tight area here, and you've got to work. And it's communication. It's active management. That alley does not manage itself. <coughs> Before our construction, there's not a doubt in my mind that Bill's team doesn't. That that alley just doesn't manage itself every day. That there's every day that they've got to go out there and they've got to deal with issues because of the tightness of it. And now, what is going to happen as well as this is Bill's going to have an active partner on the other side of the alley, and we're going to need to similarly do the exact same thing that Bill and his team have been doing in the alley, which is you're going to have to manage it. You're going to have to deal with that finite space here. Um, so let me just stop there. And I know there's some things that I'm sure I skipped that I told these guys, and I only want to stop because I want to talk more about what you guys want, and I'm literally one hour and three minutes away from first pitch. Go ahead. Peter, hi, I'm Deborah Hall from Strive, and I applaud very much many of these changes, especially getting rid of that horrible garage that was planned for there. Um, my question is, again, on the alley. We were told back seven or eight years ago that the BRA was now requiring all loading docks to be recessed. And I wish, of course, Strata's loading dock was recessed, but I was not in control of that. Um, so I'd just like you to talk about the loading docks there yeah. for 165 and 130. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So let me go back to, um, it really doesn't matter which plan you use. Uh, let me talk about, and I'll use this plan here. Uh, First and foremost, um, in, in the 160 North Washington building, there isn't an opportunity to do internal loading docks because the building sits there today. And so, so that doesn't have internal and closed loading docks. Um, but what we've decided to do specifically, so, so to others that may not know this, there's a loading dock here, which is the, I'm calling it the Strata, but it's the commercial portion, I believe, is the one that uses this loading dock. Shared. Right here. The shared. So the loading dock here that exists. There are two loading docks over here, one that can accommodate small trucks, one that arguably can accommodate larger trucks um, that are part of the Commerce project here. We've made the decision on the 131 side, right? So on this project over here, that we've actually removed the loading dock because what happened was when we all of a sudden then had a fourth loading dock, right? We went from three loading docks to fourth loading docks, then all of a sudden we had the potential of adding four trucks actively loading, unloading, and it's not so much when they're sitting still is the problem. It's actually when they're moving is the problem. It's the turning radius is yeah. about it's when it's when the truck says, okay, I gotta get into this alley. The trucks aren't pulling forward, they're reversing down this alley every time. When they're pulling out of enclosed loading docks, the turning radius is so wide that it became a conflict with, for example, the loading dock across uh, for, for the shared for the for our neighbor. So what really what we've decided here is that this loading dock here um, is gonna end up being a shared loading which will create connectivity between these buildings so that these buildings have the opportunity to share that loading dock. The reason we feel good about not adding another loading dock besides the traffic conflict, I think that's a pretty obvious point, so I don't, I don't think it's all I taught anybody new on that, really had to do with um, the fact that this project still has the same amount of retail as back in 2006. We, whether in December of 2012 when we did Commerce or now, there's no proposal to increase any amount of retail presence, it's exactly the same. But by changing from apartments to condos in the 131 building, we fundamentally have changed our need for loading docks to accommodate large trucks. And that's because the move-in and move-outs related to a condo and medium are just so fundamentally different than apartments. And, and we can you know, discuss again our experience at the Clarendon, which is 103 condominiums and 178 or so apartments. And you know the number of 
resales of the condominium since 2009 pale. I mean, a handful um, compared to the amount of turns that we had in the 178 apartment units. And every time there's a turn, there's a big truck that comes in and, and takes stuff out. And, and, and really, we have to, our management staff at that project have to, has to very actively manage the loading docks just to accommodate that type of issue, especially during, not surprisingly, end of months, to be able to do that. So by making that change, our, the 131 team for a large loading dock really diminished that need for it. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not gonna have to do what I talked about before, that I think Bill and Bill's team does across the alley, which is actively manage mm -hmm. the alley. You're still gonna need to actively manage because just like I know that, you know, the, the Strata building deals with UPS trucks and, and FedEx and the people that come two, three times a day. And we're gonna have similar issues and we're gonna have similar, and then we're gonna have food deliveries at certain times of days. And, and the good news about food deliveries and things like that, those are all time things. You can actually time those with your vendor and, and be more thoughtful, whereas the FedEx guy is not so much a time thing. You know he's coming generally between this time and this time. You know he's coming generally two or three times a day, depending on what's going on there. Um, so we're still gonna need to actively manage it. But we you know, made the decision that adding a fourth loading dock to the alley wasn't the smart decision for us um, in, in this case. Does that answer? Does that help Almost, answer? but as I remember the early drawings, which is you have another drawing yep. of it, those loading docks on 165 were not there. So, so, right, so these loading docks were added in December of 12 with the Commerce Building, right. I'm sorry, down here. Right. Um, what, we, what we've eliminated, right, and as a byproduct of a couple of things, uh, the loading docks that were proposed for 131, um, because they just didn't make sense. First of all, the turning radiuses didn't make sense because the truck's there. But admittedly, I will tell you, it also relates to the fact that we've now reused almost the entirety of the first floor for the resiliency things by taking everything out of the basement and putting it on the first floor. We, we actually have used that space as well. That's fine. Are there going to be any restrictions on times of delivering of big food trucks delivering at 11 o'clock at night? Yeah, you know, I think the, the answer to that question is, I think almost always that is a conversation to be had, and certainly I can tell you from our perspective to, to the Strata residents, which I think are more particularly concerned than the commercial user of that building. Uh, that's a conversation that we should have with Bill and with you guys and figure that out, because for the most part, on the retail side and on the food side, they can all be time <coughs> deliveries. We can say you can't arrive before this time or after this time, so, so we don't anticipate that being a problem for us to be able to find an accommodation of that. Um, this is a, this, this, this alley um, just requires that type of collaboration. So it, even if I don't say it today, the realities of it, and just like what's happening on the construction side today. All right, now the construction guys have been terrific and you manage that very well and we appreciate that. I just think this is going to be a disaster with UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, moving yep. trucks, delivery trucks now, which we don't usually have, um, I just am worried. No, and, 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 and so I'm not gonna stand here and say, because again, the, the, this is a situation that, you know, back in 2006, this, this problem existed, and, and I will tell you well, that our plan doesn't. there external floating docks in yeah. 2006. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't, but, it, but the, the, fair enough, but the, the location and the amount of volume are not related to each other. It's really the volume, the volume is the same type of volume, if anything, I think so we've now decreased volume because we've removed, in essence, um, you know, the apartment style, which again was back was 250 plus units at that point in time. Um, so I hear you, and it's not, I, I, I can't stand up here and tell you this is ideal. The alley, nothing we can do in the alley is ideal. All right, from what we're calling Lovejoy Place, because it sounds nice. Um, you considered, you know, when there, you considered the uh, 12 commercial spaces that are in the parking lot, uh, off from Causeway, yeah. so that 50 feet includes that, yeah. Those, that includes that park house. You were really down to a tighter, yeah. tighter yeah. area. Which, coming which speaks exactly to the turning radius discussion I was talking about, the trucks pulling out of um, um, loading docks. And, and I think by having them, that they're not pulling at a sharper angle anymore, but the trucks aren't pulling, like pulling into an internal bay at a 45 degree angle, keeps them from swinging out wide when they come out. So really what you have is you have them backing up straight and wiggling into their, their thing, being able to come out straight to, to deal with Build those those parking spaces. Um, so certainly we and everything that we've looked at those spaces that have been contemplated. Um, and the garage parking the strata that, that is not a time. Yeah. Either way, same the same exactly. Um, the before I forget, I just wanted to share one other thing. By by, as you may or may not recall, that parking garage that we've been talking about was located in this portion of the building, and it went up ten stories. Um, where that garage.
garage was. By removing that garage above the second floor of the building, um, we basically have taken that massing out of the building. And so I will be the first to tell you that doesn't create new views where views weren't in terms of the water, but what it does do is it materially increases the distance between these two buildings. It takes it from about 50 feet to 92 feet or 93 feet, and it really allows a lot more light and air anyways in the alley, which you know, until recently was a very dark just place because there was such close proximity between the buildings. It was really a canyoning effect end to end of that alley. So that was a significant change um, as well. Peter, to continue the conversation about loading. So can you explain how the trucks are going to turn and how do they potentially impact the pedestrian access to the, to the wharf? I've been told that a vehicle can do no worse uh, than backing up in terms of public safety. That's the worst possible thing that especially a truck or any vehicle can do. So could you explain how that's going to work? Yeah, so, so the short answer is we've achieved the worst a vehicle can do, because there's only one way to get in an alley and one way to get out. One way you go front, one way you go back. So you can either decide you're going to back in first and pull out straight, or you're going to pull in straight and back out of the alley. And, and so, in this, in, yeah, so, so in this scenario, trucks are going to end up pulling down Beverly Street and have to back in this way. We've decided in talking with our engineers, it's better than having them pull in and then back out because they end up are going backwards towards the pedestrians as opposed to here, at least when you get in the alley. There'll still be people. We can't ever pretend there's not going to be people, but in terms of really where the normal behavior, the pedestrian pathways are going to be, there's less pedestrian pathways back here. So, so you're right on, again, to the point that this is not um, this is not ideal. It's not any different than what was approved in 2006, but 2006 was far from ideal. So this is not ideal. So really what we wanted to do was take loading, as much loading as we can, and creating another loading dock, for example, to force us to really have to schedule deliveries, manage the process there so that we don't have four loading bays, you know, and, and try and reduce it as much as possible. But you've nailed it, David. I can't say anything to defend that. But, but I'm process. sorry, remind me, did the previous proposal include internal uh, loading such that they could pull into the building no. and then yes. back out? So in the, so in the, 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 in the 131 building, in the 131 building, the original drawings had been recessed. There was no turnaround location. You had to just back in at an angle. And so I thought you couldn't see it. Here, you had to back in at a 45 degree angle. No place, though, to turn around. There's no place big enough, frankly, for anything for. So even in the previous proposal, trucks were turning in Beverly, backing back from Beverly. Doing the exact same movement I just described to you. Okay, thanks. One thing that does argue for, in addition to managing the schedule is limiting the size of vehicles. I know in some supermarkets, for example, they do not allow tractor deliveries. Yeah. It sounds to me like this is that kind yeah, of Yeah, so, so I think the good news here is if you look at the spacing of these two loading docks here, this loading dock here is actually designed such that you can't get a 40-footer above, I believe is what it is. I don't know that we can get above a 40-foot um, tractor trailer from here. And that was just because First of all, the site's constrained. There was just no place we could put a loading dock to do it. So this is the only bay loading dock in this side that can take the longer one. This one can obviously take a longer one too, but, but in terms of the two loading docks here, there's only one that can accommodate the larger. We've talked, and this was a byproduct of conversations with Congress, to give some comfort to, to everyone. This loading dock here is the one that's for the exclusive use of, of Converse. Um, it's not shared. And the important point about that is that's the smaller one. So Converse chose that loading dock in their perspective, it's more often that their trucks are going to be small trucks, not large trucks, so they didn't need to have the exclusive loading dock to be the one that allows them to have a large truck. So I think that speaks to the volume. As to restaurants and whatnot, it's not as though these types of uses, if they're restaurant uses, for example, are going to have 18-wheel Cisco trucks coming up. These are going to be meat, fruit, and vegetable, and an occasional dry good delivery, which may be in a larger truck. But in terms of the regular deliveries, they're going to be what we're box truck or the bread truck type size here. So, um, I'm sorry, did you have your hand up? I had a, you were commenting that you needed to pull forward and back into the alley. How do you actually control that when a truck arrives? Well, how, how, well, you're saying how do we control it? Yeah. Well, how, it's, it, the, how, yeah, how, is, how, how is it controlled to make sure that a driver pulls forward and backs in as opposed to just coming in? Yeah, and again, I, I, it's a great question. A lot of it's going to be a learning behavior. I mean, most. Can I, can I Sure. I live across from the elephant ramp behind the garden. 
Um, and I watch those trucks go into the, the garden, those great big 18 wheel or whatever those things are, the humongous big trucks. They, once a driver tries once to pull in forward, they know they can't do it. And they back right out and then they go up National Street and then they back in and it's a very narrow ramp that they have to go in. Those guys are good, that's all I can say. <laughs> I think the other thing I would say here, and again, I, I'm gonna point to our prior experiences and what we're doing, we're a really actively managed property. This is not a, this is, and, and again, the only way I can color it for you is say go to the Clarendon one day and just see the people walking around what we're doing. At the Clarendon we have seven loaded docks. We have a 24 hour a day postal annex for the back bay as part of the Clarendon, which is really, I think, a really interesting story. And there's an alley which all those trucks have to go down 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And one floor below. Too. Huh? And there's a restaurant. And, and there's a restaurant mm -hmm. post 390, right? It's shared one, with one, residential parking. One floor. I'm sorry. Is it shared with residential parking as well? Uh, they come off in, another Yeah, they, they can there's, come off that alley as well. There are spaces in the alley. Yeah. That, so, that's, that's, that's the issue. I mean, it's, it's not shared with residential parking. Right? No, I understand. And I'm not. It's, that conflict is there, and I, I don't deny what I want to talk about. But it needs to be accommodated for, yeah. and I appreciate the trying to make a correlation with Clarion, but it's not a, a, an equitable comparison. Yeah, and, and, the, and, and I wasn't trying to equate trucks and, and vehicular commerce. Right. What I was trying to actually correlate was the fact that in terms of how you deal with, with managing the environment that you're in and how we actively manage that. In that scenario, you have six of the seven loading bases. Yes, yeah, so you have total control. Whereas in this situation, you don't have total Well, we actually control. don't have total control of it because we don't own the alley. The alley is the exact same type of ownership structure that's here, which is the people on the other side of the alley own to the midline and have rights of passage for the entirety of the way. So it's actually very much analogous to the situation. I think what's important, though, is that we deal with a much more multi-use complex with many more loading docks that have to actively manage that loading situation every day, 24 hours a day. And so again, my own point there was um, we over-manage a lot of respects because it's an environment, it's a feel for, for our residents. It's, it's not all selflessness, it's selfishness too, which is what we're trying, trying to create an environment here. And there are parking spaces on that alley. That's a good point. Jim. What do you mean uh, by the actively managed people? Actively managed means that our management staff is spending as much time in the alley and in the loading docks making sure that, that trucks are coming at the right time, that deliveries, for example, the post 390 restaurant are coming at designated times, and if they're not coming at designated times, we'll send them away. Um, because you're dealing there with just, I mean, you can't even pretend this is not even up to the scale, seven loading docks, right? And you're dealing with three million pieces of mail a day being processed through the facility here. So it's a very different environment. So it's really about just our management isn't sitting behind desk. And again, I think it's, and I don't want to say it's, it's not different to what I think Bill and his team had to do every day as well in the, in the alley as well. I can't speak specifically to all the details, but it's not. It's not a desk job. Managing property is not a desk job. It is being out there and it's every day, picking up that phone, having the walkie talkie, knowing where the problems are, knowing where the people are going to be, and being out there dealing with it. And a lot of it's a learned behavior, which is in your property management team, when it's not obvious when you pull down an alley and the truck driver didn't find it obvious that he shouldn't pull down that way, it's a learned behavior. It's having that person sit there and say, Whoops. you know, shake them by the shoulders. Seriously? Um, it's that type of behavior. Uh, Jerry, can you address uh, restaurants? How are you going to store the garbage? How is it going to get picked up? How not have cleaning? Yeah. Uh, all, that's a great question. All garbage and refuge is all internally stored. So the good news is that by dealing with resiliency in the 131 building, we free up a lot of space at the lower level. <laughs> so uh, quite candidly, the, the garbage is going to be actually maintained at the lower level. And there's actually an elevator that comes up from the lower level that will take it out when the garbage truck's coming. Only then will the garbage in smaller bins come out and be disposed of so everything's internal uh, in the building. Uh, clearly, there's no place in the, in, the, um, in the alley to maintain storage or would it be appropriate. Uh, candidly, I don't know what they were proposing in 2006 because the plans don't actually show anything for trash and trash compaction at all. So I just don't know what they had thought about in 2006. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your choice to use pavers because it looks like there's going to be an awful lot of uh, vehicular traffic coming in and out of there, and you've got a view corridor towards your visitor center yeah. that could be drawing pedestrians who may not realize that they're walking into an area where there's also shared with, with traffic. We had an unfortunate experience in the North End 
with a lunar on uh, Cross Street that a couple of times we had narrow uh, close close encounters with uh, cars and pedestrians, and it was all it's all red. So to your average pedestrian, it just doesn't look like some place where they expected traffic. Yeah. And we we ended up closing half of it to traffic because of that. And I think you could potentially end up with a similar situation here if you're using papers and it's not immediately obvious yeah. to a pedestrian that there could be. No, that's, that, that's a fair comment, and, and I'm not going to pretend to be a landscape architect here, but but certainly the dialogue to date has been that the sidewalks are a different material than the roadways, the crosswalks are a different material, yet to again create a environment that is more clearly identifies the areas and nuts. And, and again, anywhere where there's a sidewalk, you have the typical whatever six inch reveal, granite curving, six inches, Larry, six inch or whatever granite reveal curving, so it's not as though this is flush that you're really dealing with an environment that you could very easily just step into the roadway and not know that you just stepped off of a corner. But it's a good point. Uh, Peter, I, I want to ask a question. Can I come back to you in one oh, second? Well, it's only because I want to. Oh, Victor, by all means. Victor Bronte, North End Resident. I have a question which involves process, or to help me understand process, which probably should be addressed to the BRA. Um, does the notice of project change reopen the article 80 process? Um, so technically, yes, right? We're in an active comment period right now. There's no uh, required comment period for a notice of project change. However, well, in I, was this thinking, I was thinking more of the PRA's petition for participation. Is there something written somewhere that says that a notice of project change is filed, the PRA shall do a Yes, receipt. yes. Right. So in Article 80, again, there's no required comment period, but typically as a matter of course, um, we at least have a 30-day comment period, except especially if it's a significant change to the project. Um, this change will require a vote from the uh, BRA Board of Directors. So, okay, that brings me to the next question. If the BRA Board of Directors votes to approve, is that the end of the official uh, process between BRA and developer? Um, not technically. Um, there are several votes that are presented to the Board of Directors typically um, related to the execution of uh, documents like a cooperation agreement, an affordable housing agreement, uh, et cetera. So after approval, depending on where they are with design, I think at, at the, the point that we go to the board, they'll probably be closer to design development as opposed to schematic. But uh, the urban design department would need to um, stamp off on their plans, and our legal department would work with their attorneys to um, uh, draft and execute those legal documents that I just mentioned. So it's a similar process that you would go through with the PNF, but well, just that's where my question was leading. Mm -hmm. Since the questions raised by the IA chief that that weren't answered, or the or the answer was we're thinking about them, we're working on them, and, and those unanswered questions, for example, affordable housing, will be worked out with the BIRA. Correct. Again, in a similar fashion, it was done. Um, in the original Article 80 process, it's just under a different um, section of Article 80. Um, I have a memory of, and this is the last question, of the of a, uh, PRA board vote uh, conditioned upon uh, the BRA doing X, Y, Z. Is it likely that that sort of vote will be presented uh, November 14th or Will you refer to specifically? Well, uh, for example, the affordable housing issue. Oh, yes. So um, the vote before the board always assumes that those documents will be executed after the fact. But typically, and the mitigation is worked out prior to a BRA board vote. Any affordable housing commitment, whether it's for a buyout, offsite, or on site, is worked out prior to a board vote. So we like to have those things. Um, so does that mean in the next two weeks? If, 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 if they're um, able to go to the, the, so our next board meeting is on November 14th. Mm -hmm. Technically with the common period ending next week, they could go to that board. There was a board meeting on December 5th and another one on December 17th. So that's the meetings that have been set up to the end of the year. But okay. technically, yes. I don't need to this out, but does that mean if the affordable housing issue is not worked out between the developer, there will not be a board vote? I think we would like to have some satisfaction of um, whether or not they were doing the units on site or a buyout or off site sure. prior so to any we, board approval. I think our board will probably ask that question, so we'd like to have um, an adequate response to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. 
my questions actually follow up on Victor's in some respects. With regard to the affordable housing, as was noted in the IAG portion of this meeting, and I want to just repeat for the record, the consistent and unequivocal position of the community, and I think everybody at this table, is that the affordable housing should be done on site. Yes. And as I said in my draft comments, I think it's even more important in this case because we are talking about a condominium development. This will have been the first condominium development in a long time. And an affordable element for that sort of ownership option is increasingly important, especially in the West End community because condominiums, not to mention apartments, are becoming less and less affordable, in part because of development trends. So I just, for the record, want to state that I think the Downtown North Association, and I think everybody else here, would very much like to see the affordable housing on site. I understand that has economic consequences for the developer, but notwithstanding that, we think it should be on site. The other question I have really is for Richard McGinnis, since he's here. Uh, does this have any implications either for Chapter 91 issues and or for Municipal Harbor Plan issues? It does not. It's consistent with the uh, Municipal Harbor Plan Amendment for Lovejoy Ward. And um, I think it falls within the um, special conditions of the, the Chapter 91 license. I'd like to add that that we uh, we just submitted a grant application for a water transportation terminal to um, yes. uh, build on what uh, the bill related project is doing to this, and we're in the process of purchasing ferries. It'd be great to get service from from Lovejoy Wharf to Fan Pier um, within a year. That would be a great objective. And in, in fact, a substantial financial contribution for that effort is being made by this project. But what was not addressed in the NPC was who's going to operate it. Is it an MBTA operation that you're envisioning? Well, the BRA will probably, since we'll own the vessels, we wrote the grant for the terminal here. Um, we probably put out an RFP for an operator, but it's also, that there could be a partnership between Beal and the Fampere Development Company uh, that does a private operation. That's so actually good, because the MBTA is far less for No, we don't want the team involved. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Well, on the Chapter 91, though, was that decision to issue a 91 license or the decision to relieve this developer of the 55 foot height requirement and allow 155 foot height, were those decisions based on public benefits? Yes. And are some of those public benefits affected by the changes that are being made? Well, the building envelope and, and height hasn't changed and the public benefits were based upon impacts under Chapter 91, you look at the pedestrian level environment. So you look at the wind and shadow um, <clears throat> difference between what Chapter 91 would allow versus what's being proposed, and there is no difference. Um, so the type of housing, the amount of housing, or the affordability of housing at no. all addressed in the no. state rules? No, that's all local city um, mitigation. Does this notice of project change have to go through? No, no, I'll answer for the developer. No, it does not. It's not a notice. It's not a project change for NEPA purposes. The BRA takes, I think, a very conservative read and engages in the public process um, under Article 80. NEPA, there's there are no new state permits required. There's no new NEPA trigger. So we did evaluate that. Yes. Um, got it. Now I'm going to come back to you. While we're on municipal harbor plan issues or that type of thing, is there any um, programming or any program for Love Dry Wharf, the wharf itself? Is it completely passive? You're going to put a couple of chairs out there and people can use it, or is, is, is there going to be something happening? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, so Rich has talked a little bit about the water transportation, so let me just start there and I'm going to work landward of the water transportation. So there'll be a floating dock that we're working with with Rich and the BRA team on that will be scheduled, anticipated to be scheduled service, uh, which we think is really important because again, just another another route, um, an opportunity for people to come to and leave from Lovejoy Wharf. Is that going to connect to the wharf or to the? It actually, right down, down here, it actually doesn't show on this plan because the the dock doesn't exist today, and that's exactly the grant that Rich is, is talking about here. But it'll be a floating dock. Uh, it'll be a high board to be able to accommodate the ferry service of Bowloader, which is consistent with the ferries that the BRA has been Will it block the view corridor to the monument? 
oh no, it's not going to be high enough. Keep, just keep in mind that this this drops down. That might tie it against that. Well, yeah, no, but the, the where it's going to be tied off of is going to be dropping down, so it's not. It's going to be, Richard, where it used to be, for yeah. no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Right. Secondly, there's opportunity for, for non scheduled water transportation services here. Um, keeping in mind that there's no private slips or anything here at this location here. There's there is short term tie up, which is, you know, when 30 minutes someone shows up here and it takes off. That's the opportunity here. Uh, moving landward now, um, again, I apologize for those that know this. One of the important changes of what happened in the pavilion with Commerce coming onto this project was uh, it's Commerce. Commerce's intention, they're occupying it, and there's a, a small retail component for Commerce, but the, really the predominant of this pavilion is going to be used for the Rubber Tracks program, which is a professional sound recording studio, which they professionally staff, professionally equip, and they donate to groups and individuals for, who have interest in advancing their music careers or, or doing something for a charitable cause, that they donate that space away, and they don't reserve any rights, they don't make any direct profits off of that uh, space there. As part of that, um, the top floor of the terrace actually has accommodations such that what can be places for people to sit and eat during the day, open spaces accessible, really accessible to the public up there. There's also areas where there's performance space uh, for them, for those same artists who would be recording inside to be able to uh, do stuff outside. Is that at the level of the bridge? Uh, yeah, so it would be on the roof of the first floor of the building, which would be closer yeah. to, the, to the level of the bridge. Then, when you flow down here, in addition to outdoor seating for restaurants and retail uses to be able to have them kind of activate the water right here, one of the predominant conversations we've been having with BRA design staff, and I will tell you, even BCDC engaged in that conversation uh, more recently, had to do with making sure that we're creating these wonderfully large green spaces, and, and they wanted large, they wanted plush, they wanted a place that people felt as though it wasn't hard-edged throughout the whole thing but to put them in places which still would allow for some significant open spaces for us to be able to program this and to be able to do things which have, I think, somewhat successfully been done on other wars. As you know, one of the challenges in activating and meeting the objectives of you know, municipal harbor plans in Chapter 91 about activating is that some, sometimes can be contrived. You have to force it. You've got to really artificially bring it to your property to, to do it, whether it's artistic, whether it's musical, whether it's performance-based type of things. And that's the same type of programming that we would uh, end up doing here. I think we have a leg up on it because of the rubber tracks program. It's something that's here. It's something that actually will become part of the DNA here, which is pretty exciting to us because I'm not sure we're the most creative people. Um, so it's great to have someone like Converse that has a really creative program that's already going to spill out onto the wharf side of things. So spaces like this, Dan, uh, and whatnot are, are designed uh, to do it. The other big benefit is that being taken over by the restaurant. No, it's not. It's not. The, the, the answer is it's not going to be. I mean, it's, it's in, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it, it falls off way too far from you. But number two, just from licensing perspective, I'll tell you my own licensing experience in terms of restaurants and how they license outdoor space. There's no way on the wharf that we're going to be um, gobbling up large amounts of this wharf space for the retail user. The other thing I would say, going back to um, one of the changes that happened with Commerce taking the 160 North Washington Street building is the front door for the office building is on the wharf. And it's right here, Commerce. And that's really important because what that does is it really brings people to the water side. It really, out of necessity, to get into the building, there's no more clear way to tell you people are gonna end up on the wharf than the fact that that's their door to access their building here. And that's pretty dynamic and that's important to us because that really, before the project previously, you could enter over here and you could traverse through and never go on the wharf if you didn't want to. You could traverse internally and have an all internal sort of relation. So that's a real fundamental change for what's going to happen on the wharf. Does your lease with Converse provide some of that outdoor area for Converse's use? Converse has none of the outdoor area. And I read, reading between the lines of what you said earlier, uh, it sounds like there's no legal limit to the space that can be used outside by the retail establishments, especially the restaurant. And my concern is the sense of Rosemore, uh, where we seem to have expanded dining outside yeah. by those restaurants. Every year it seems to be. Yeah, no, I enjoy well those non restaurant well. seats, like I said. No, I would, so, so I think you need to look at it the other way. We actually have no right for outdoor seating currently. I mean, this doesn't, this process isn't what's giving us the right for outdoor seating. We're going to have to go through a licensing effort to be able to get the outdoor seating. And, and you're also the management plan that is, will be implemented with DEP. Checking anyone license will have 
test specifications in terms of your outdoor space. Rose Wharf is, is unique. It doesn't have a management plan. It's not obligated to. It proceeded and is, is, exists under a special act. So it's a totally different animal than this will be. And what requires you to have a plan? The Chapter 91 license. Right. Yeah. Sure. All right, so we got 32 minutes. I'm good to go. <laughs> Where are your residents going to park? Great question. Um, so we went through a bit of a conversation before. Um, they're going to park off street on some off street, off site location. Jim is the is the answer. Um, we are going to have to work with uh, every single one of our residents to, uh, to the extent that they want to secure uh, off site parking. We're going to work with them um, to secure off site parking three years in advance of when we're going to be delivering units, and it's, it's uh, almost exactly three years. We're not going to start construction until. Late 2014, because we need this site to finish the staging for the 160, the Commerce Building. Um, I don't have all those answers. Meaning we, we can't go out and get three year respective agreements here. Um, but it's in our interest to make sure that every one of our buyers has that answer because if they don't have an answer, then those buyers aren't going to buy units. And I'm not going to build a building that I don't think I'm going to be able to sell. So are you likely or possibly going to have like a valet parking? You know, we actually, um, I don't think that's the first answer, Jim. I mean, the reality is, even if it's a valet operation, the cars have to go somewhere, right? So I think really the first answer, and, and it's um, not one that I have 100% clarity on, so I don't want to overstate or make it seem like we have all the answers on this. Um, I think we got to find out where the destination of the cars are and, and how they get there and how they're done is, is, is a slightly different conversation and certainly one that BTD and the DRA is going to have uh, opinions on thoughts on it, so that's the process. Like a term of LA parking is, at that point, then you're really not eliminating the traffic. You're just bringing it in, and somebody else is going to run right back out again. And in fact, you're actually doubling traffic if indeed you do have the LA parking. Yeah, well, we're, 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 we're going to, as to Beverly Street, you're right, as the alley, maybe not so, but you're, you're I understand your point, Beverly Street. Again, the, the other point that I'm, I'm sorry, Jim. Okay. The other point I'm going to make here, Jim, is that we are, trying to take cues from what's been happening at the Clarendon, where I will tell you we've been surprised by the how few unit owners are. When we have our 393, 63 car garage right underneath the building, it's 100% valet garage and you can't sell park it, but we've been surprised at how few are using that, and that's not located nearly in proximity to <laughs> convenience and public transportation like this one is. So we're taking cues as well as what we think the net demand is really going to be. But the flip side is, and another data point, is in the Charter building, 50 feet away, that we have a waiting list for parking space. Yep. So the owners in terms of people that they rent to indeed have cars. Yep. I think we actually have a pretty percentage, it's pretty high percentage of parking spaces to units. And you're closer to the T than this building. <laughs> <laughs> you are by 50 feet. By 50 feet. There. He is correct. I cannot you brought something up just now. Where are you going to stage this 131 Beverly Street? Oh, great question. Um, so when one, so 160, <coughs> so let me talk about construction sequencing. Uh, the first thing that gets done in the project is the wharf. The wharf is, is as evidenced by if you go out there today, it feels like it's really getting there. Uh, the wharf will be done um, um, summer 2000, late summer, early fall 2014. At the same time, we'll be finishing the exterior portions of, of 160 North Washington, but most importantly, we'll be turning over the building um, to Commerce, um, so that Commerce can be, begin its build out internally um, in there. So fall 2014 is about that time period is when that's happening. This area is being used currently to stage right. the 160 because we have nowhere else to stage that from. It's an existing building, it's yeah. boundary to boundary here. When that's done, we can start working on 131. It will be a 10 foot perimeter fence, right? Same and, and the Strata residents and people know now where the line is that we have there. There'll be a fence line around the footbridge of what will be the 131. All the staging and everything else for that, however, will be done inside that fence line. So for example, when we have a tower crane, most likely we're gonna end up putting it in what will ultimately be the elevator shaft, right? Which is not an unusual thing to do after constraint sites. So for this one, we're gonna do it all inside the fence line because there is no other place for us to do it. So, but we can't start that until 160 is done. My name is Sue Bivinis. Yeah, I live in the North End. Um, I, uh, it seems that this is probably more to city planning than it is to you, but it seems like the parking issues in this area have not 
been planned for, and there's this pipe dream that it's not going to be an issue, that no one's going to need cars. And I don't know if anyone knows the amount of new residents that are going to be in this area. Does anyone on the board know? 3,000 3, 3, new yeah. units. And suddenly we don't need to have parking. I think that it, when you look at each building one at a time, you tend to minimize the impact that we, you know, there won't be so many cars. It's not going to be an issue. It is a huge issue, and I think it's going to impact everyone's lives that lives in that area. And I think, you know, parking has to be planned, and it needs to be planned far in advance of building out this whole area. And I want to build on that by underscoring what Bob said earlier. Bob laid out the full scope of the parking demand. It's not just the residents. It's the visitors to the residents. It's the office workers in the Converse building. It's the visitors to the Converse building. It's the people going to the restaurant and the retail establishments. I don't doubt, I would expect that Converse is even going to put on some kind of uh, conferences maybe within their very large building. And there'll be some parking. Demand. There definitely will be a parking demand created by these buildings. There's no doubt about that. And you are able at this point to estimate that demand. There's plenty of examples, uh, even in the immediate area, let alone other parts of Boston, to know what the parking demand is going to be. The BRA, at least up until recently, has been using 0.4 parking space per residential unit. For instance, maybe that's changed recently. But you're able to, to calculate that parking demand, and you're able to do it at different times of the day or different days. And I think that the public needs to know what that parking demand is. I think the board of the BRA needs to know that before they consider approving this project. What I can understand you may not be able to do at this time is to come up with a, an off-street parking management plan that accommodates that without impact to the communities around this site, which is, which is uh, Sue's point. There must not be impact to those communities. The closest parking garage that I'm aware of is the Brinks, and that's where many of us in the North End park. It's still the and, park. Yeah. and we don't want to see an impact to the Brinks, for instance, or any other off-street parking that is extremely limited in our neighborhood. To say that parking isn't needed for people living in urban areas, just look at the number of cars in the North End, and look at the, 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 uh, the number of cars way, way beyond the amount of parking spaces that exist in the North End. And that's just one example. If so I, I think just getting to Victor's point that this parking management plan should be incorporated into any BRA approval for this project, that it's contingent upon an approved parking management plan that maybe is developed a year or two or even three years after the approval. Uh, it must be, I think it should be publicly reviewed and approved by the BRA, and it must not have impact to the communities surrounding this, this project. May I make uh, two more points related to the parking? The Briggs Garage in, um, the economic environment right now isn't so great. Um, a few years ago, there was a six to seven month waiting list to get a spot in that garage if you lived in the North End. Now there are spaces available. But when I leave in the morning, when I do travel, and I do, I use the hub bike, I use the train, I use the cabs, cabs. Um, you know, I don't use my car that much, but when I do need to use my car and I'm leaving in the morning, there's a whole separate group of people that are renting spaces for the day that come into the city. They don't park there overnight, they rent spaces during the day, and the only reason they can manage this is that a certain amount of cars are leaving and a certain amount of cars are coming in. And there is a huge demand for spots, and to say that, oh, we're all going to be riding bikes um, all winter long is ridiculous. It is yeah. ridiculous. Just for the record, I don't think anybody is saying that. And certainly, 
the planners in the West End community and at the BRA are not planning no on-site parking for any or all developments. In fact, every development planned in the West End has on-site parking built into it. This is the only, the first and only one, I would suggest, uh, that doesn't, which is why this is being analyzed very carefully. But I wouldn't extrapolate this to other projects. Every one of them has on-site parking. Now, when we began the planning for the Bullfinch Triangle, basically starting in 2003, the effective parking ratio was 1.0. Okay. That, based on experience, was reduced over time to 0.5 and now 0.4. What we are finding is that the parking that is being built for some of these projects actually is more than is, is required. And now they are building down to that lesser demand. This is not, this is the only one that has suggested no on-site parking. And the Brinks Garage, I, I agree with you completely, is an issue for the North End community. But Lovejoy Wharf is not actually closest to the Brinks Garage, it's closer to the Delaware North Garage. The Delaware North Garage, before Delaware North took it over from the MBTA, was operating at 40% capacity. Now that's not going to continue forever because Delaware North is managing it somewhat more effectively than the MBTA did. But there is a lot of garage parking in our area. What we have asked these people for is not agreements with those garages three years in advance, but to make a commitment that such agreements will be in place for whatever the parking demand is, because it can't be left to chance. It's got to be accommodated both off-site and off-street. We can't have more competition yeah, for the limited you're, you're right, parking. I agree with you. I just so, to make sure that that was But I do think we have to analyze this as a unique case not as the first of several or the last of several. If we had to deal with this issue in every development in the West End, we'd have a major, major problem. Well, that was that but we exactly my concern, that if we're, you know, we do it piecemeal, this could all get lost. Yeah. But it, there but are it is, like 3,000 new residents in that area. Correct. And we need to make sure that there's parking. For those right, and that be as the result of of community participation in that planning process. That didn't happen by mistake or by accident. And parking was a fundamental part of that discussion in every project and for the district as well. Uh, the garden, excuse me, the TD Garden Garage, I think is not a relevant data point because you can't go and buy monthly parking. I try to go and park overnight there and you can't. So you're not sure. Yeah, but maybe, maybe inside. Yeah. Okay, but so yep. we're so to David's point, it needs to be integrated into a plan. Correct. The yep. plan needs to be approved and executed before an occupancy permit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Couldn't agree more. And I, I think Peter put that in more either. We haven't talked much about. You just deputize yourself as my spokesperson. No, we haven't talked much about the conversion <laughs> from <laughs> apartments to condos and also the reduction of units. The, the units went down from 2006 to today by, by how much? From what Original point? approvals were 250 units. So it be 175. Now you're seeking to convert those units from apartments to condos. Well, I'm not actually seeking permission for that because I don't need permission for that. Okay. I, so, but but, that's what I, but, I, but what I'm telling you is that that's what we're doing. I think it's important to neighborhood to understand that. It's an interesting point that you just raised that you don't need permission to do that because I, I was wondering. Does the BRA approval in any way um, kind of regulate what kind of housing will be constructed? We've been told as part of the 2006 proposal for this project, we've been told uh, as part of all the other projects that, the, that we must build all these things and we must allow them to go to higher and higher heights because we desperately need housing one, and we've been told that we desperately need rental housing, that we learned a very tough lesson from 2007-2008, and we're now paying the price of that lesson in skyrocketing rental costs. And so there's the promise that's been made by the mayor and the commitment made by the mayor that we're going to see a lot more 
housing, and we're going to see a lot more rental housing. And these projects, including this project, was one piece of that promise. And I'm just wondering, did the needs for the rental housing go away recently? And, and how does this fit into the BRA's planning for, for real stable economic development in the city of Boston and the ability to have sustainable neighborhoods? I think um, there's a couple of different answers to that, but one thing is that we have to um, respond to the market. So we can't force someone to build a condominium project if they can't get finance to build condos. It would be a waste of everyone's time. Um, similarly, there's going to be a point where all these um, apartments are going to get approved and the, finance, the um, people who finance these projects are going to look at the absorption rate and say that there's no way that the market's going to be able to absorb all these rental units. So um, the BRA, to um, the point that it can, tries to encourage condos and rentals in different situations. Some neighborhoods absolutely do not want rental housing. Mission Hill, they would love to have condos because of the student issue. So we have to look at each neighborhood differently. It's not a matter of um, a citywide. We need to look at each area and, and the specific needs and, and what's going on there um, in relation to um, existing uh, people who are uh, living there now and, and the market conditions. So. But that these kinds of protection, protections are the things that zoning is all about. So zoning, zoning does, does have not some control. I, that I'll agree with. Mm -hmm. but, but we've also seen with this project the conversion of what we're going to be housing units to office space. Over at uh, the Trinity project that isn't yet built, just about to be built at one canal in the Bullfinch Triangle, it started out as a condo project. Then the market changed and it became an office project. Then the market changed and it became an apartment project. It's still not built. I know they're designing those units to be condos eventually. Oh, they're pulling apartments. So, uh, yeah, they're they're rentals, they're they're rentals they're not condos. So, so anything, you know, I, I look at all this, there's this is broader problem that I see of this, this uh, road paved in gold one way, a one way street paved in gold. The developers can do whatever they want at any time for maximum profit. And the, the city doesn't have enough regulation or doesn't exert enough regulation. And it's not just regulation. We know that the mayor and the BRA can get things done through negotiation as well. And you know, we, we, I thought we negotiated these things. I thought we gave them, gave them huge extra hype. We may have, did, did this project get tax breaks under 121A? Converse got. Converse got, Converse got tax breaks under 121A. So, you know, over and over, we keep uh, negotiating <coughs> in faith. We keep providing relief to these developers, but it always seems to be a one-way street. I, I will say though, David, of the 3,000 units that we're expecting in the West End, the overwhelming majority are rental units. And in part, it's because we have not been able to get condominium units developed. We want a balance between ownership options and rental options. This will be the first condominium development in the West End since Strata was converted from apartments to condominiums. And that was, what, 10 years ago, Jim? And before that, before that, it was Hawthorne and, Whitt and uh, Whitt Whittier Place. I mean, it's been a very long time since we were able to get condominiums developed in this neck of the woods, which is why I think it's important to have on-site affordable units in the condominium. It's been a very long time since we've been able to get any development in this area. Uh, it's oh, I can't, no, that's not true, that's not true. We've got a lot of new development yeah. in this area. We've been working on it for right. 20 years, so. Right. Yeah. This is probably one of the most highly developed neighborhoods in the yeah. city. And I think we encourage it as a mixed-use neighborhood, not just residential, not just rental, not just condos, not just office, not just supermarkets, not just retail. Um, One supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get a supermarket. Why didn't you start that? <laughs> You're almost out of here and you brought up the supermarket. It's going to happen. Move to I can say that I live in West End Place. Now that was the new building. That's 15 years it's ago. And it was a, a 15. No, it's 15 years ago. Because that's how long I've lived there. That's how long you But it's been there. But if that was the only new building in like 25 years, now we've got lots of new. We've got 3,000 new units coming in. How many? 
Yes. No, they there's no guarantee David, David, that there, you've got, there is you've going got to be Avenir, a mix of You've Japanese. got the Victor. Yeah. You've got all of these. Yes, they are too. They're so this, occupied. This is, this is, this, these changes are being made as it's being built, so anything can happen. All I'm saying is, isn't there a planning goal for this area? Doesn't the BRA have a master plan? And aren't they influencing this development the to create, to, to fulfill the master plan objectives? All right, so let me just ask something. Over here, just to round our questions here, because I think, yeah, I'll well, oh, uh, okay. start you. Oh, uh, just, just a quick uh, observation. Although, although, of course, uh, an owner developer can decide to build apartments and then convert them to condominiums, the law permits that. Nevertheless, the BRA has leverage to say that they cannot get involved, which I don't think you have said, but um, they have leverage. Yeah, they, no, I, I, they I, can I, affect. I think that's actually a very good, good observation. When there are legitimate reasons to do that, there is a meaningful, thoughtful dialogue always as to the community, what works for the community here. I specifically want to point out that absolutely would prefer to have condominiums because mm -hmm. of the student housing issue. And the BRA is very involved in, in those situations too. Um, when at all possible, encourage that and to have different restrictions about um, not renting the students. Trust me, we, yeah. you know, when at all legally possible, we insert ourselves into those discussions. Well, I guess what's coming out of this is we hope you pay attention to it in this neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, Samantha Allison from Strata, forgive me if I missed it, but could you clarify on the height from the old rendition versus the new? You're saying the height is the same, but it's the middle part where it dips down in the old rendition looks Higher in the They're both 115 feet. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you're talking about this area right here? Yes. Right? This is 115 feet here. This is 115 feet right here. How many so stories? Exactly. I'm sorry? Sorry, how many stories? Uh, 11 stories in the midsection. So, uh, relative to what it was prior? Uh, 11 stories in the midsection. Okay. But in the belly of it, behind the residential units here, on the other side of it, was this big vault of a garage but still in the same building mass. Right. Are you asking to the prior plan, or are you asking what was there? No, I'm not. Prior building, not prior plan. I'm sorry, prior, prior building. building. Jim, I've answered this question for you previously. Do you remember my answer? Because I don't know. My dimensions have feet at that point. Well, then I'm going to stick with it, because I don't remember answering that. So he said about 10 feet, which is this building is 10 feet lower in the mid, higher in the midsection. Oh, no, this is going higher. This is in the midsection. Yeah, I'm just asking in the midsection, higher 10 feet. Yeah. Plus it's going to have potentially mechanicals depending on where you're at. Oh, it's correct. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. he's, he's uh, consistent with the 2006 plan. He's, he's not correct. Yeah. Okay. Just so I represent properly. It's okay. Right. okay. Um, yeah. um, well, the tower. Uh, what's the height of that? I'm sorry. Far right. Right. On the far right side, where the, uh, the tower, what's the height of that? Just so I properly represent it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's 155 and 115 are Again, we're using zoning heights bill, okay. right? Or what the, what was originally approved, and that's what this current plan shows as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.